we're at St. Andrew's Abbey, and this is the chapel, a place that I know very well. I spent many years here, four years, rich, the richest days of my life, I think. Looking back at all, over the 92 years, it's a very special place. Oh. People through the years have asked me what was so special about being a monk. Beside the spiritual journey, it was about community, about brotherhood, being part of a, a unit of prayer and, and creative thinking. It was the journey which is supported by brotherhood and the interest in turning our minds to a higher source that we, we all share, actually. Uh, this area here is outside the chapel, and this is where I shot the main scene of the monks at mass in my short film, La Daute. It was all in this area. Shooting La Daute, my purpose was really to show the uniformity in human seeking religion or seeking a spiritual path. I wanted this young monk to experience the world outside that he was leaving and entering into a monastic life. That's basically what that film was about. And this statue was the opening of my film La Daute. Well, you know, what brought me to the monastery was we were doing Shakespeare at the Immaculate Heart College. And uh, one of the monks who actually had found the place here saw the play and invited us to join them, to join the monks at the priory. It was a priory at that time to do uh, a play for a festival. They were creating a festival of the arts, paintings, play, theater music uh, and uh, so we did the play here and that's how I discovered that period of my life I discovered the monastic life and I came up into Van Ermo and, and joined the monastery uh, this was being built this amphitheater the festival was such a success that they created a series of festivals throughout the early years of the monastery. And this was built during that time that I was here. My brother Tony directed Waiting for Godot here and played a leading role in it uh, right on that stage. It was an extraordinary experience. I mean, it showed you the openness of the monastery, the Benedict in the way of life, to include the arts in the way of prayer. I was born in 1931, can you believe it? And this is 2023. So I was born in Greece. My father and his two brothers had a restaurant in Gary, Indiana. They were all bachelors at that time. And so my father wanted to marry a Greek lady. So he went back to Greece and married my mother. My mother had great difficulty delivering me and I was considered a blue baby, not expected to live. My father, being a religious man, took me to the cathedral, which was right across from the hospital. There was a, a Greek Orthodox icon of the Virgin Mary and Jesus, and he laid me down before the icon and said, save my child. And then I began to breathe. And so I guess that's what he always thought was a miracle. 
Anyway, I'm here to provide something that uh, uh, then my father returned with my mother. I was three months old to Indiana, to Gary, where he had this business cafe. And um, then there were, I have to include the other siblings, there were five of us. There's Anthony, Tasha, Angie, and John. Uh, I remember being the eldest, I was pretty bossy in the tradition of the Greek. Some of the Greek traditions is something happens to the father, the eldest son is responsible for the siblings. <clears throat> that put me in a terrible position. I was given power and I should, I should never have been given that power. <laughs> I, I became a member of the senior dramatic class when I was a freshman. I forced myself into it. And uh, at least the teacher was accommodating, thank goodness. And that seemed to be a, where, a place where I could really express myself and work out this business of who really I am. I wanted to be someone other. I, I needed the fact to sort of become another another character. In a scene uh, from Taming of the Shrew, I was playing Batista, the father of uh, Catherine, and there was a sword fight among her suitors, and one of the actors, one of the student actors, used a sword, which is an ROGC sword, and swooped, slipped right across my face into my nostril blood was starting to come out and I did the thing that I am ashamed of. I ran off stage looking for a nurse. <laughs> if I were really a, if I had been that convinced actor, truly true to my profession at 16 years old or 14, I would have stayed on the stage and finished the scene. So I was in this competition and I won, I won. So I used the money to enter the American Academy of Dramatic Art in New York, which had a great history of producing some incredible actors, including Spencer Tracy, um, Lauren Bacall, um, Jennifer Jones, and many others. And John Cassavetes, who I became close to, I was part of a group that John Cassavetes started, an acting group. So I did a couple of plays off Broadway. Then I found an agent who came to see the play and encouraged me to keep on working in, in the field. And so one of the people I really admired in the acting profession in the theater was Elia Kazan, and I, I, had the, I had the balls <laughs> to go knocking on his door. I found out where he lived. I said, I, you're Greek, then I'm Greek. I want to work for you. And he laughed and he said, well, if you come to, to you, if you get yourself out to Hollywood, I'm doing a film called East of Eden. I am, and I'll get you a little part. And I did. And I came out here, and that's how I ended up in Los Angeles. Dear Mr. Frank, thank you so much for your charming letter. I am wondering how you are managing at the Ziegfeld. I myself am a bit too busy at the moment to afford myself the pleasure of meeting you just now, but I will do my best to see you later on. All good wishes. Sincerely, Laurence Olivier. Dear Mr. Frank, I am so sorry that I shall not be able to see your performance in Angel Street on March 4th, as I already have an engagement for the time stated. Yours sincerely, 
Laurence Olivier. My dear Nicholas Frank, thank you for your letter. It was not only charming, but very amusing. I'm grateful that you want to work with me. Perhaps we shall, as ever, Joan Crawford. Dear Mr. Frank, I know that not one moment spent in the development of your talent will be wasted. And while it may be almost offensive statement to you, you are very young. It may be that God in his wisdom does not want you to have an opportunity you may be unready for, but does want you to realize that you can make this time of apparent obstacles a time of preparation. Sincerely, Barbara Stanwyck. Dear Nick Frank, thank you for your sweet letter of January 18th. I know how disappointing it must have been to have been cut from the picture East of Eden. I'd love to have you visit me on the set of Queen Bee when I start shooting in February. Joan Crawford. Dear Nick, thank you for your sweet letter. And any time you feel like visiting us on the set, please do so. Joan Crawford. Dear Nick, I shall be in Cheryl Crawford's office Monday afternoon at about 2.30, and I will certainly be most happy to see you, Nick, if you can come up at that time. Sincerely yours, Elia Kazan. Edna Burbank's another story. I met her, I knocked on her door. She was doing Giant. She introduced me to George Stevens. And I thought I would be perfect for her to play the, uh, the, ma the young Mexican character in it. And he said, you think you'd be right for that? I said, I could be right for anything. My, my aggressiveness came as a result of being still at high school and reading a book in the library on how to make it on Broadway, okay, which encouraged you to knock on every door you could. And so I, I took that as uh, gospel. <laughs> I knocked on a lot of doors. <laughs> a lot of these stories, I'm ashamed to have to admit. <laughs> I wouldn't think of doing that at all at this point in my life. Of course, who would, <laughs> who would cast an old man <laughs> as a young Mexican <laughs> and try it? After a few years, about eight or nine years, I was doing plays with the drama department at Immaculate Heart College. One of the uh, members of the audience of the Shakespeare play I did was a monk from the Benedictine monk. And he was establishing a series of art festivals at the monastery to attract local people. And while there, I saw, I got a glimpse of the monastic life. I was impressed by the tranquility and the kind of routine, the religious routine that the monks had in that establishment. And I thought, I would like to try this. Uh, the next thing is I asked the superior if I could join. I was astonished that I was doing that, but it was a life that seemed appealing to me. Uh, I was accepted, but I was told that I had to do two years of philosophy at Loyola University. So that's when I went back to Los Angeles and studied philosophy and some theology. One of the um, Jesuit priests had seen me play Touchstone at Immaculate Art. <clears throat> I saw him on campus and he approached me. He said, I've seen your work. Uh, I know you're very creative. Why, uh, how are you feeling about doing some creative work here on campus? I suggested that we do every man, a medieval play, and do it in, as it was originally done in chapels or in the sacristy of a church. So we did it at the Loyola University's Sacred Heart Chapel. That brought some interest in my my creative life uh, while studying philosophy. Well, while at Loyola University, preparing to go to the monastery, uh, I was behind putting on a, a film festival. And 
Some really great people came with great films. George Stevens came with A Place in the Sun. Charles Brackett, the producer and writer of Sunset Boulevard, came with Sunset Boulevard. Mervyn Leroy came with the first really great social film, uh, I Was a Prisoner with the Chain Gang. And the festival was such a success that the public relations Jesuit asked me to, because I was leaving to join the monastery, asked me to bring in another director or directors for a second year festival. I had read an article in the LA Times about Jean Renoir, this famous French director who was sitting in the hills, the Hollywood Hills, waiting for an offer. He, he really had a difficult time when he moved to the United States and escaped the Germans who had invaded France uh, with his wife, Dito. And uh, so I, I was interested in finding a way to get to reach him. And it turned out one of the students on the council that I was on <clears throat> who had Jean Renoir's phone number. I mean, how... How you know how could destiny really work its way through uh, presenting this filmmaker's telephone number and got to make an appointment to meet him at his home in Beverly Hills and I was invited by his secretary into the living room of this home and there were Renoir paintings on the wall his father's paintings, even Cezanne's. I was sitting in this room with all this richness around me. And then this fellow came in, this gentleman came in. He looked like he could have been a, a guardian at, at, a, uh, at a hospital. He's just a plain clothes gentleman, heavy set, rotund, and came in and looked at me and said, why are you going into a monastery? Somehow his secretary had told him my story. And I was left with having to answer. And I simply said, I just want to do something that has meaning in my life. At that moment, our eyes connected. And it was a highlight in my life. This gentleman became a friend. Jean Renoir became a friend at that moment. Even at the monastery, he and his wife visited me and we stayed in touch. It may seem strange to someone listening to this story that I was so devoted to acting and theater and film and then I took this right turn and went into a spiritual routine. I was bothered by the fact that I was attracted to other men. I thought, what's happening here? And I figured that the routine, the commitment to a spiritual life would somehow balance that out and make life bearable. So I gave myself to that religious experience of becoming a monk, where I was actually lived there for four years. It's called sublimation, sublimating the natural powers into something more refined, something more dedicated to doing good for others. And so I, I committed to that until I finally found out I discovered that I had a human side that needed expression, having fallen in love with a monk. And that's a whole other story. <laughs> when I was at the monastery, a uh, new novitiate arrived and he he was out of place in a way. He was very frustrated, I could tell, because he couldn't, he was a novice and they weren't allowed to do any creative work other than the monastic work. 
and I saw that he had done some sketches of a Madonna. And uh, I thought, well, he's got a talent. So I went to the uh, novice master and I said, Father, this fellow is really creative and he think he's a little frustrated with the monastic life. Probably if we gave him permission, if you gave him permission to continue his art on, at the right hours, the right time, he would be a ha much happier fellow. And so he did, he gave him permission. And that made that young man give me such love that all of a sudden I was involved in, in a real feeling of compassion and love. And I hadn't had that in the previous years of my life. I mean, not that kind of love. I was scared and frightened. I went to the superior and I told him, and he said, has there been any contact? I said, no. Uh, just just the normal daily contact. And I said, what do I do about this? He said, you tear him out of your heart. I was astonished. I thought, that can't be right. That can't be right. Um, which later on, I'm thinking now, before any young man or any age, man of any age goes into a monastery, I think it's essential they be asked, have you experienced human love? Because if you haven't experienced human love, you shouldn't become a monk. Now, I think the church would be terrified to hear that, the rules being what they are. Uh, but it's something that happens in life, in our human nature. There are some of us who fall in love with our own sex. What do we do about that? Is it something that really others can tell us what we need to do? Don't we have to discover our own journey in terms of love? Uh, I left the monastery not wanting to hinder his vocation. But a year later, he contacted me and wanted to be with me. But he was not interested in a physical union. And that was another kind of challenge for me to deal with. Um, we remained very good friends through the years. Um, so where did we go from there? Life. At least there's a human heart beating, which says you can love. I, uh, yeah. When I was in the Benedictine monastery, one of the local persons who was a, a supporter and sponsor for the monastery was the sister of Maria Huxley, Huxley's first wife, Hollis. So that's being a good actress? Oh, good. Being oneself? Well, you think so? Is, you think of life then as uh, something that's theatrical? I think whole life is a big comedy. And if you will, who said that we're all like the Shakespeare? After I left the monastery, she would keep in touch with me, come to Los Angeles, pick me up, we'd go to a cafe or a restaurant. Because she was part of this family, the Huxley family, she knew so many people, including Igor Stravinsky. This is a, a picture of Stravinsky and uh, Balanchine taken in uh, Beverly Hills in Stravinsky's house. And this is Aldous and uh, D.H. Lawrence in Switzerland. And uh, we had gone way up in the mountains, come down cross-country skiing. Here is Aldous and Maria. 
we're having we're having a picnic and uh, here comes Juliette who is still alive by the way Julian's wife and there is Julie one day she said Stravinsky is conducting Symphony of Sounds in the music center tomorrow would you like to go so we went to the the Los Angeles Symphony Orchestra with Igor Stravinsky conducting and uh, afterwards she said let's wait at the stage door so he had already suffered a stroke <clears throat> but he was once he got on the stand he would walk in as a man with a stroke and on the stand when he lifted his hands to conduct the orchestra he was a different human being energy in that figure was astonishing, just powerful. I can imagine him conducting some, uh, the Rite of Spring or Fire for Firebird. But afterwards we were at the stage door and Stravinsky was coming out with his wife. He saw Rose as we were standing at the side and he pulled away from his wife and he said, share Rose and he gave her a kiss. And I witnessed this, these amazing human beings, creative beings, who had created such great music. When I left the monastery, I went to visit Jean Renoir. I said I would like to make films. I was hoping I could get into UCLA Film School. He said, here's the name, Colin Young. He's the Dean of the School of Motion Picture. Call him. I called him the next day and he must have received the message from John himself because he said to me, you're Nick Frangakis, come over and pick up the application. And I was swiftly entered film school because of Jean Renoir. And that set me on a direction where I ended up making films. Small, humble little films, not big productions. <laughs> At UCLA, we had to make a film. And we had to do it with non-dialogue non, uh, non -dialogue film. So I thought this was an opportunity to have music as the dialogue. There are three parts to the Symphony of Sound, and La Daute is called the, the third part. Is is called La Daute. <clears throat> so I kept playing that music, and then these images came up, and I would write them down. I would say, I need an image of, I need an image of the sun coming up behind a chalice. I need an image of a child being born. I need an image of a group of, endless group of children holding palm leaves coming towards camera. And I was able to capture that. At the monastery, where we were shooting the monks around the altar, I heard that there were a group of visiting children from schools visiting. And there was like, there were like 50 kids. And I said, let's get olive branches. We got some olive branches and I gave them to the kids and they came in towards camera and we did it slow motion. So it was paced with the rhythm of the music, of the chords of the music. So it all sort of, I was helped. I mean, for instance, the key young man who was figured, who was having this stream of consciousness wasn't a monk. We had lost the actor who was going to play that part. He refused to come drive out to the desert. So this young man was making a retreat there. And I said, he looks like the perfect young monk to present the stream of consciousness that these images were going flowing through him. So I said, are you ready to be on camera? We threw him a, ham a habit over his, and, and he became a monk all of a sudden. 
So he became a monk. To me, the Symphony of Psalms is one of the great musical masterpieces of all time, up there with Bach. He, Stravinsky, through his music, conveyed the deepest kinds of religious experience in terms of praise, because that's the word laudate in English translates praise. Praise for the gift of life, for the gift of being able to create beauty, for the gift of being able to create scientific experiments and scientific accomplishments. Um, we are such a curious breed, this human condition. It's amazing. To me, it reflects that there's got to be a God or whatever you want to call a source of creation, a pure, a pure source of creation. Uh, and so when I heard this music, it brought out this real deep feeling of gratitude in me. And so I wanted to put a series of images together that in somehow said, we are human, but we're blessed by the gift of life and we praise the source. It was shown at Royce Hall with the, the best of the student films of 1966. One of the funniest things happened during the screenings at Royce Hall of our student films. Uh, one of the filmmakers who had its film in the, in the uh, program would have a stopwatch. And so one evening I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm just keeping track of the audience reaction. And your film has always had the longest applause. I was surprised because in a kind of uh, diverse diverse society it basically has a religious theme but basically it speaks I think it speaks to a lot of people. Alan Davio, the, my friend who shot the film, he showed that film that got him started in commercial filmmaking. Channel 5? Anyway, they were looking for a cinematographer to do some music and videos. And he showed them La Dante during a work print during at UCLA in the workshop. They came and they saw it and hired him. It was the beginning of his career. I had taken the Laudate and shown it in Greece and I played at the Greek Film Festival in Thessaloniki. So I got back to the States and I looked up Alan and he said, I'm working with a new filmmaker, I'm doing a film with him. Uh, he, he would like to meet you, he saw Laudate. I went to this workshop or this uh, editing room on La Brea and uh, Melro and Santa Monica at the time. And there was this young guy. Hi, I'm Steve Spielberg. Hi. They were making Amblin, the first film that got Stephen his contract at Universal. The story of how I ended up at Franciscan Communication Center making religious films was that uh, one of the uh, staff members of the Franciscan Communications was Corrine Hart. So one day when I was without work and looking for work, I got a call. It was Corrine and she said, we saw your film Laudate and uh, would like to interview you. Would you come down to the Franciscan Communication Center? And I said, sure. So I was interviewed and got the job and made a series of films that one of them won an international award, uh, Catholic Communications in Monte Carlo. And that was Eucharist. At the Franciscans, there was a team 
that made, made uh, decisions on what films, what projects will be made and which film wouldn't. And I propose this idea of Eucharist where different sections of humanity, you know, uh, old folks home, soldiers out in the field, immigrants harvesting and basketball, students playing basketball, all this variety of life could come together to somehow support the idea that we're all part of a great scheme. <laughs> That's a divine scheme. Uh, quite a couple of them just said, it sounds too abstract. I don't think students would get it. But they were overruled, fortunately. <laughs> and, and Carl Holsteiner, the main producer, said he would take a chance on it. And it became the biggest seller of, of all the work that they ever did. 3,000 copies were sold of this 16 millimeter film. Take it. Cock it. Cock it. At the same time, it is the duty of a father to protect his daughter. It's the duty of a father. I thought my condition was hopeless. You should have seen his face. He's broken, Joey, broken! with actors and actresses, I gave them complete freedom to come up and show what they had. And when they were nervous and came to me saying, I'm not sure, I mean, I'm insecure about this, I said, you have the knowledge and the talent and the experience. That's why I chose you. In my book, you're perfect for what we're doing. If there's any fear, just say goodbye, chase him away. And so I should practice what I preach. Because <laughs> I feel a little odd <laughs> with you doing this. But You do? Why, why do you feel odd doing uh, this? Well, I was always the guy who wanted to be behind the camera, unless I was acting on the stage. When I was on the stage, that's a whole new world. I mean, a different world. Because what you're doing is you're, you're expressing for a company of uh, an audience that's made take, taken time to come and see you. So it's a different experience. But with media, I've always wanted to be behind the scene. I'll tell you a funny story about the difference between the stage and or the film. Uh, I was at a party. This would have been in the uh, in the eighties, a Hollywood party. A friend of mine was giving, Bob Kaler, who was a director. And um, there was a woman there talking about, I don't know what I prefer, the stage or the screen. They're two different experiences. I, I, I treasure them both. So I went to uh, Bob and his wife. They were in the kitchen. And I said, who is that? She's talking about how she, whether she prefers the stage or the screen. You're talking about Lynn Redgrave. <laughs> I've tried to shut my mouth on a couple of occasions when I make mistakes and it doesn't work out. I, I have to have a word in about it. One afternoon I was visiting Jean Renoir and I said, I was doing a film for the Franciscans 
and I was having a little bit of a problem with one of the technicians. Uh, and I said, I asked Jean Renoir, I said, when you're dealing with the crew and you're working with the actors and you're trying to get your work done with the actors and the crew is there standing waiting, what do you do? Because I, I'm, I'm puzzled about how to handle the crew. They're just standing there saying, we're ready when you are. And he said, what you do is you get them in a corner, watch this scene carefully. I'm having some issues with it. Just let me know what you think. Watch carefully. And I said, and when you did the scene and you, should, and you finished, did you ask them for their opinion? He said, of course not. I must say about my brother Tony that he's been really behind a lot of the success that I may have had. He's a great editor. He's a director himself. Actually, he came and worked at the Franciscan Communication Center a year after I had joined and has made many more films than I have. Um, but he has been at my, my shoulder and my back when I'm in trouble in the editing room. And uh, also in concepts, he's got great ideas and concepts. He's been very important in my life, my brother Tony. While I was working at the Franciscan uh, Communication Center, uh, I got word that one of the directors from the Greek National Theater was going to be in town. And he had directed some of the Greek classics in the Greek National Theater in all those amphitheaters in Greece. And he said, I'm going, I've been invited to go to see the Playhouse at UCLA. <clears throat> so we were watching a performance, a rehearsal, and all of a sudden a lovely young blonde gal comes up the aisle and sits in front of me and turns around and says, hello. And I say, and she's gorgeous. And I say, hello. Mm -hmm. And that began the closest friendship I've ever had with a woman. A beautiful relationship that's lasted many years. My friend Candace. Years later, after his passing, his book, Renoir, My Father, had attracted me and I wanted to pay homage to both Renoir, both Renoirs. And uh, I asked Dito Renoir, the widow, if I could have the rights to the book, an option to the rights of the book. And she gave it to me. And so for years later, from, uh, from 1990 to the present, I'm 2023, I've been trying to get this film made Anyone I'd go to, it didn't matter how difficult it would be to get to them. Once I mentioned Jean Renoir, their ears opened up, their eyes opened up. They wanted to know more about the project. It's gone to people like Robert Altman, who was look, absolutely interested in it for a while, and then it, it, the money didn't come in. And, and uh, Quincy Jones had great interest in it, Peter Bogdanovich. It just has not happened yet. And I, I kind of mull it over in my mind and think it's not happened because the right elements aren't there yet. The elements being the other talents that are in, would be involved in making a film. And because uh, it takes more than just one person to make a film. We all know that. Although usually some directors take you all the credit. <laughs> uh, I was at ICM with Robert Altman's agent. And with us was uh, a producer from Hong Kong who had made the martial arts movies and made millions. And so it looked like this was going to happen. And during that meeting, another agent who later I realized had seniority over the agent that Robert Altman had, had came into the room grabbed the money man, the man from Hong Kong, and left. And the deal was over. 
the money man was taken to another project that ICM represented. And later, someone said, so what's new in Hollywood? <laughs> the first person who was involved in 1989, when Dito Renoir gave me the rights to the book, Jean Renoir, uh, Renoir, my father, was uh, Louis Malm, who was very close to the Renoirs, read my, uh, it was a treatment, a screen treatment of the story I was going to tell. And he said, can you get yourself over? It's, it's a, good, a good idea. Can you get yourself over to Paris? So I got over to Paris and he introduced me to the, it called, it's the, what, the PBS of France. Uh, and they were interested, but they wanted Louis Mal to do it. And Louis Mal told me, he said, I admired Jean Renoir so much that I wouldn't dare do a film about him. They invited me to do a film about Proust. I, 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 I refused because anyone I, that I've admired on that level, I didn't want to mess around with it. And I thought, well, maybe I'm making a mistake. But I went forward. <laughs> went forward trying to get people interested in this genius. Renoir was a genius, as his father was. And I thought that was an interesting angle on the story. A one genius pro propagating another genius, bringing another genius into the world. Mm. You know, the reason for my wanting to make this film about Jean Renoir was the immense admiration I had for him not only as an artist, but as a human being. He made several statements during his life which really impressed me. One was this, all that is human is familiar to me. That means he accepted humanity as it is. What that did for me, that when I read that, was wanting to attain that kind of consciousness that really we're all in this together and that we should have understanding and compassion for what it is that the human foibles that exist. Uh, none of us are free from flaws or mistakes. And to recognize the fact that we have this frailty and that we have compassion to meet with it, with each other. And that's what I'd like to convey through this film, through this work. <clears throat> that's, we all have a place in this journey. Some people believe that I'm a film director. That's not true. I'm not a film director. <laughs> Some other people believe that I'm a writer. I'm not a writer. Some other people believe that uh, I'm uh, good to help actors to act. I don't think I'm so good. What is the truth is that I'm a storyteller. I like to tell stories. You know, I know stories. I have some stories which are inside myself, and I feel like an urge to tell the story. And I tell the story. Now I tell the story with a camera, or with a pen, or with a typewriter. Well, to me, it doesn't make very much difference. Yes. The main thing is to tell the story. When I was a child, about nine, eight or nine, <clears throat> there was an icon of the Madonna and child. Uh, and I looked up at the icon, which is facing directly, and the lips, her lips started moving. Now, I began to be really uh, frightened. And I started to cry out, Ma, before I was able to say, Ma, the head moved back and forth and said, no. But I finally did say, Ma, and she came in to the bedroom, but the, the, the icon became what it usually was, just a still, 
uh, subject of the Madonna and Child as if it had never happened. Now, years later, I think of that episode as I question it, did it happen outside my myself or was it part of my thinking, my imagination? And you know how I answer it? It doesn't matter. Something special happened. Later years later, I studied, I, I had Jungian therapy and some of these things were answered and some of these things were left open. Um, but there's always been this quest for investing the mystery of existence, how we are here, why we are here, how we do we, how, how do we respond to, every human being has this a challenge to respond to the reason for their existence. I found that somewhat in my work with making films. And I think the creative aspect is the one that should be nurtured most in all of us, because we all have that creative ability to make something. Renoir, once when he was ill and I was visiting him in his bedroom, <clears throat> He was looking out at his window and it was his last days. And he looked out the window and he said, turned to me and he said, just think the greatest thing in life, someone can go into their yard and make something with their hands, make something. That's the greatest thing. That was an insight. He gave me a gift to understand that creativity is the way where anyone who's challenged in any, on any level makes something with your hands, with anything, just make something.